Good morning. I want to welcome you to worship here at Willow United Methodist Church in Willow, Alaska. We are thankful that you are joining us in this virtual worship space. And we pray that whenever you watch this service, at whatever time of week, whatever time of day, that you will sense the presence of the living Christ surrounding you and that you will feel the welcome of our congregation extending to you. My name is Christina Dowling Soka, and I, along with my spouse, Joe D. Dowling Soka, have the great privilege of being the pastors here at the Willow United Methodist Church in Willow, Alaska. And it's on behalf of the whole congregation that we welcome you. Today in our service, we'll be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And we would invite you to participate with us. You can do that by gathering bread and juice in the a quiet sanctuary of your home or wherever you are viewing this, and we would invite you to participate fully when that time comes. We also suggest that you download the bulletin or bring it up on one of your devices. You should find the link wherever you found the posting of this service. That will help you to be able to uh, sing the songs and uh, read the scriptures as they're being read and also to and participate in the responses as they take place. Today we are thankful as always for Mary Lemmings for the beautiful piano music and we are thankful for our lay leader Julie Mitchell who starts off the service. Today our readers are Jeff Bertran who will be reading the epistle and as a very special treat we have uh, two of the Gunn Logs and grandchildren. We have Parker and Catherine and their mother Kirsten who will be sharing in our gospel lesson this morning. It comes from Mark 5. Uh, last week we uh, preached on the first half of the passage that we're going to be reading. We preached on the story of the woman who reached out to touch the hem of Jesus' garments and how interruptions are part of the life that we share together in Christ. Today we're going to be looking at the second half of the story, the raising up of Jairus's daughter. And I hope that as you hear uh, that story and as you hear the sermon preached that you will hear the living Christ saying to you, arise. And now may you be blessed in this time of worship. Welcome in the name of Christ. here and also online. We're pleased that you could join us on this Independent Sunday. So. All right, so this morning for the greeting, your response is, O oh Lord, gather us in. Let's try that. O oh Lord, gather us in. Today is a day of healing. New birth, new hope, new joy lie waiting. O oh Lord, gather us in. We bring our own hurts, fears, needs, our own struggles and inadequacy. Yet Christ gathers us all in. O oh Lord, gather us in. Christ embraces us all, just as he embraced the children of his day. And he says to the hurting child within us, Arise, be healed, be whole. O oh Lord, gather us in. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Love gathers us in and makes us one. O oh Lord, gather us in.
Our hymn of praise is Gather Us In. It's number 2236 in the faith we sing. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Oh, look up and out and praise God for the joyful awakening of each dawn, announced by the singing of birds, the morning light to guide our steps. Oh, look up and out and praise God for mountains and hills bathed in shadows and light for singing streams and for clouds dancing in the wind. Oh, look up and out and praise God for radiant beauty, glorious color in wild flowers, forget-me-nots and fireweed, the vibrant greens of summer. Oh, look up and out and praise God for refreshing breeze and warming sun, for the constancy of waves on the shore, the dazzling surprise of pink-orange skies. Oh, look up and out and praise God for breaching whales, soaring eagles, the companionship of pets. Oh, look up and out and praise God for long-sought rain, for cool nights, the northern lights, dazzling stars. Oh, look up and out and praise God and see a thousand windows showing us God. It is always sunrise somewhere. Hallelujah. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our hymn is, O beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. Let's sing. Oh, mountain majesty. 
time for our children's message. I want to invite all of you who are with us this morning and worship all the children to come up close to the screen. I have a special message for you. I've been thinking about our hands, and I've been thinking about all the ways that Jesus used his hands to do good things. Oh, there's stories about how he uh, healed the eyes of persons who were blind or helped persons who couldn't hear with his hands. He uh, lifted up those persons who were uh, feeling low. Today, there's a story where he takes a little girl's hand who needs his help, and he says, arise, take hearts, and he helps her to stand. And I was thinking about how there are stories of how he fed the people. He broke the bread, and he blessed it, and he gave it. And he used his hands to uh, say the words of peace and to calm the storms. I was thinking that we can use our hands, too, to do good things. Did you know that you can say, I love you, with your hands? Here's how you do it in sign language. I love you. Or here's a fun one. Jesus loves you and I love you. Can you try that? Jesus loves you and I love you. Sometimes you use your hands to wave hello and make a new friend. Or maybe you use it to blow a kiss to someone far away. Maybe you use your hands to turn the pages in your Bible or your Bible storybook to read a wonderful story about Jesus. Maybe you use your hands to write a letter or to help put a bandage on someone who needs some help. So many ways we can use our hands. And we can use our hands to pray. Let's say a prayer. You say it after me. Dear God, dear God, Thank you so much, thank you so much, for Jesus, for Jesus. Help us to use our hands, help us to use our hands to do good in our world, to do good in our world. Amen and amen. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Our first reading this morning is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. I know a man in Christ who was caught up into the third heaven 14 years ago. I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body. God knows. I know that this man was caught up into paradise and that he heard unspeakable words that were things no one is allowed to repeat. I don't know whether it was in the body or apart from the body. God knows. I'll brag about this man, but I won't brag about myself except to brag about my weaknesses. If I did want to brag, I wouldn't make a fool of myself because I'd tell the truth. I'm holding back from bragging so that no one will give me any more credit than what anyone sees or hears about me. I was given a thorn in my body because of the outstanding revelations I've received so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger from Satan sent to torment me so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, My grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weaknesses. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'm all right with weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Our gospel lesson. 
lesson today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 40. Jesus crossed the lake again, and on the other side a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Jairus, one of the synagogue's leaders, came forward, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded with him. My daughter is about to die. Please come and place your hands on her so that she can be healed and live. So Jesus wept. A swarm of people were following Jesus crowding on him. A woman who was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Her bleeding stopped immediately, and she sensed in her body that her illness had been healed. At that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, don't you see the crowd pressing against you, yet you ask who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it. The woman, full of fear and trembling, came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. He responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. While Jesus was still speaking with her, messengers came from the synagogue leader's house, saying to Jairus, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? But Jesus overheard their report and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid, just keep trusting. He didn't allow anybody to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James' his brother. They came to the synagogue leader's house, and they saw, what, saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went, to the, he went in and said to them, What is all this commotion and crying about? The child isn't dead, she's only sleeping. They laughed at him, but he threw them all out. Then taking the child's parents and his disciples with him, he went to the room where the child was. Taking her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kwomi, which means, young woman, get up. Suddenly the young woman got up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were shocked. He gave them strict orders that no one should know what happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. That's Catherine and Parker and Pearson, that's gun locks and grandchildren. And thank you, Debbie. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your presence in this place. We give you thanks for each one worshiping with us here and each one worshiping with us online. Lord, you know our needs, and we pray that you would touch us and heal us and free us up to be the children that you call us to be. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I've always loved the Max Lucado book called You Are Special, which was written for children. Maybe some of you have read it. The story begins showing us a typical day in the land of a group of wooden carved people called the Wemmicks. Now the Wemmicks are all very different. Some of them have big noses, others have large eyes, some are tall, some are short. They're made out of different kinds of wood. Some wear hats, others wear coats, but they are all made by the same carver and they live in the same village. They are a curious lot in that they spend all their time either giving each other gray dots of disapproval or bright and shiny golden stars. The gray dots are put on people that the Wemmicks have considered have are inferior in some way. Maybe they've messed up. Maybe they are different. Uh, uh, they, they just put them on as a way of putting them down. The gold stars are when you do something wonderful and accomplished. But the thing is, is the gold stars are the gray dots are totally at the whim of the people. The Wemmicks with the stars are very full of themselves and they are very proud. And I must say that they are not very kind. Well, 
The main character in our story is a woman called Punchinello. Poor Punchinello. He can't do anything right. He stumbles. He has scratches on his paint. He can't jump high or do any tricks. And he is covered with dots. The sad thing is that he believes the dots. He believes that he is a pretty bad Wemmick. And the hard thing is that any time a new Wemmick comes into town, they see that he's already covered with gray dots and they just add more gray dots to poor Punchinello because they assume that he deserves it. But in our story, something wonderful happens. Punchinello meets a different Wemmick whose name is Lucia. She's a Wemmick who has no dots and she has no stars. It wasn't that people didn't try to put stars or dots on them, it's just that they didn't stick. And she was free of the dots and free of the stars and Punchinella asked her, why is it that the dots or the stars don't stick to you? And she says, it's easy. I go to see Eli. Now, she invites Punchinella to see Eli. Eli is the woodcarver. He's the one who made them all. He's the god figure in our story. Punchinella finally musters up the courage to go to Eli's house, and it's so big, he almost turns around and leaves out the door, but then he hears something amazing. He hears his name being called Punchinello. Punchinello. Eli calls him by name. Eli says, hmm, it looks like you've got some bad marks. Punchinello says, I didn't mean to, Eli. I, I really tried hard. Eli says, oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what the other women think. Punchinello says, you don't know, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They are women just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think, and I think that you are pretty special. Punchinello says, me special? Why I can't walk fast? I can't jump? My paint is peeling? Why do I matter to you? And then Eli puts his hand on him and he says, because you are mine. That's why you matter to me. Every day I've been hoping you would come to see me. Punchinello says, I came because someone, I met someone who had no marks. I know she told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her, Eli? And then this, because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. Punchinello says, I'm not sure I understand. And Ela smiles. He says, you will, <laughs> but it will take time because you have a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day. Let me remind you how much I love you, how much I care. Remember, you are special because I made you, and I don't make mistakes. I love that story, and I love that line. You will understand, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come and see me every day. Punchinella is special because he's made by God. And it reminds me of that, my favorite verse in 1 John 3, 1. See what love the Father has given us that you should be called children of God. And so you are. Well, in the story, Punchinello begins to believe Eli. And as he does, the first dot falls to the ground. He begins to find healing. He begins to be set free. He begins to be able to become the Wemmick. He was created to be. Friends, I believe that the Gospels are all about the healing and the freeing power of God. The freedom to live without stars, to live without dots, to find our identity as children of God, our hope in Christ alone. This Christian life is something we can't do in our own power, in our own strength. That's what the epistle lesson was all about that, that Jeff read to us. That Paul is saying that he had a lot to boast about, but he, he could only name his weaknesses because in his weakness, he is made strong. It's in our weakness that we find strength. 
I love the section of the gospel that we are in right now. We've been preaching through the gospel of Mark this year. And in the section we are in today, you see story after story after story of Jesus bringing hope to people who were covered with dots. Hope to the hopeless. The disciples had this stormy ride across the sea. In the Gospels, the sea stands for chaos. And in the midst of the storm, Jesus says to the stormy waters, Peace, be still. And when they get to the other side, they go to the land of the Gerasenes and they meet a man without hope. And they meet uh, two other hopeless situations. They, on that side, they meet three persons, three families in hopeless situations. And particularly in the first two situations, the hopelessness is compounded because the persons have received gray dots from their communities because of situations beyond their control. He goes to a man, a man who is not in his right mind, who's been forced by the community to live outside of the village, to live among the tombs. And Jesus restores him to his right mind. He stops for a woman. We heard her story last week, a woman who reaches for the hem of his garment. This woman had been cast out of her community because of her illness for 12 years. The number 12 is a symbolic number. It means a long, long time. And we talked about how God stopped the march of eternity. He stops in the midst of the race to help someone else. He doesn't mind being interrupted. And the woman is healed. And maybe you remember, on the other side of that race, there's this little girl. Her name, we don't know. <laughs> we know that she's about 12. We know that she is Jairus' daughter. To catch you up in the story, uh, uh, Jairus is the leader of the synagogue, a very important person in the village, and he comes to Jesus and he says, please hurry. The woman interrupts on the way and precious moments are delayed and and. It, as well as healing her, he stops to name her. He doesn't have to stop to name her. She's healed. He stops for her, and he, he calls her daughter, and he restores her to the community. Well, that encounter takes too long. And so the folks from the village where Jairus lives says, ah, they say, ah, it's too late. Don't trouble the teacher any longer. And it's at that point in the story that Jesus says something very wonderful. He says, don't be afraid, only believe. You all say that with me. Don't be afraid, only believe. And then comes this marvelous story of God's power coming to this little girl. I always love that saying that says, uh, when you get to the end of your rope, you should tie a knot <laughs> and hold on. And for me, this story is one of those stories. It's a knot that we can hold on to because it speaks of a God who forever holds on to us. I love this story about the one who comes and meets us where we are, even when those around us think there is no hope. In the story, he takes the little girl by hand and he says these words, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say, to you arise. <clears throat> and I got to thinking about that story and our story. And my hunch is that some of us are children, and we hear that with children's ears, but my hunch is that every one of us has a child inside of us who needs to hear the healing words of Jesus. I think about my daddy. My daddy was a a preacher for many years in the, for, in the Florida Conference. Before that, he was a smashing uh, piano nightclub entertainer. He always said I should call it a supper club, but it was a nightclub. He played the piano, <laughs> and he served uh, churches near and far. He was amazing, a spirit-filled man with deep laughter, deep joy, deep kindness. He loved to go on picnics with his children to make memories. Mama said, childhood is for making good memories. And he was the best of daddies. Well, he lived with us, uh, or near us, the last several years of his life. 
And when he was uh, near Muncie Church in Johnson City, one of our youth was assigned to go and interview him. Daddy had been a veteran in World War, for World War II. He had served in World War II. And uh, he had lived through the Depression. And this teacher wanted these students to just hear their stories, the stories of some of the old timers in the community. And so Marlo came over and she interviewed Daddy. And Daddy could tell a lot of good stories about the time since he met my mama. But it was interesting, he had no good memories he could share as a child. He had an over-harsh father. His family was an immigrant family from Hungary. And as an immigrant family, he as a child was often bullied. One of his earliest memories was at the age of four losing his mama to depression and thinking, what am I supposed to do now? where he told the story of when he was five, getting a little paste jar at the age of uh, five, uh, and having that jar taken by bullies and smashed in front of him. He tells the story of, of uh, being hit by a brick because he was an immigrant. He tells the story of falling in love with a little girl when he was about age in his class in school. He was always a very friendly, outgoing little guy, and he would pass her notes on his shoe. He would write her little love notes and pass it to her on the shoe. And, and one day, he got a little note back, which says, I like you too, but do you have to ask so, act so dumb? <laughs> and at that time, he said, something within him just died. Of course. Great love and grace and healing came years after, and Christ became real to him. But when I would hear those stories, and so many stories of persons like him, you just feel like gathering that little child inside of him in. I think about myself. I grew up in a wonderful family, uh, a healed family where love and laughter and gentleness prevailed, and yet even so, there was a hurting child within. I remember one night at a youth Bible study, I was a part of a Bible study group on Jacksonville Beach, Florida. We had this dynamic and intense youth leader who knew how to gather all the children in, all the youth in. He could gather in the surfers. He could gather in the, in the cheerleaders. He could gather in the persons who were nobodies at school. He could gather in the folks who were experimenting with drugs. He could gather uh, in the straight-A students. He, he gathered us all in. And one night for Bible study, he uh, wanted us all to write something down on paper that we just didn't feel we could share with anything else. Well, I was a straight-laced kid. I didn't have anything earth-shattering to share. So I just simply wrote that I felt inadequate most of the time. Well, Forrest was his name. He opened those up, and he spent a little time with the folks who were experimenting with drugs, the folks who were having uh, relationships. What surprised me, though, was he spent the most time with my little slip of paper. He was concerned that anyone in that crowd would feel inadequate. And he wanted each of us to know before we left the room that day of how incredibly important we were to God, to him, to how much we were loved. And he said this to me. He didn't know he was speaking to me. Where did you learn you weren't good enough? You see, somewhere along the way, the child within us is wounded so that we feel inadequate and struggle to be good enough. We believe in the dots that others or ourselves put upon ourselves. A man by the name of John Bradshaw has written a book. Uh, he's written lots of books. One's called Healing the Shame That Binds You. Another one is On the Family. And he talks about how we learn from an early age, he calls it poisonous pedagogy, we learn that we aren't good enough. And we internalize what he calls shame. Uh, he says it has to do sometimes with the rules of our society which are unfortunate, which creates these circles of exclusion which are abusive and shaming. 
And he says that what needs to be most healed within ourselves is shame. He says shame is different than guilt. He defines shame as non-self-acceptance, as a being wound. He says, uh, guilt says, I made a mistake, where shame says, I am a mistake. Guilt says, what I did wasn't good. Shame says, I am no good. Well, Bradshaw believes that the shame within us, that's in that hurting child, <laughs> who had all those dots put on us when we were little or whatever age, can be healed. He says we fill the gaps with lots of things, and it's why our society has become so compulsive. But he says that there is a process of recovery where we can uh, undergo healing. It has to do with naming our brokenness and recognizing our powerlessness giving up our need to always be in control, learning to trust a power greater than us, finding a family of faith that can support us. And he says, that's recovery, and then it has to do with uncovering, <laughs> letting all those dots fall off of you. And then it has to do with discovery, discovering yourself to be a loved and beautiful child of God. And that's where I believe our scriptures become so important. The story that I shared with the children, uh, the story of Jesus welcoming the children, that zooms ahead from chapter 5 where we are in Mark up to chapter 10. Jesus is an adult, busy, engaged in life, and yet he stops for the children. And to understand the passage in its context, you know that children in Jesus' day were people of no account. They were like the outcasts and the wounded and the woman and the poor and the foreigners and the people of the earth. So this image of Jesus gathering the children in and growling at the disciples for saying he didn't have time is such a beautiful image. And then in our passage today, he stops for this wounded little girl. In our text, he goes to Jairus' daughter. And he says to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl. I say to you, arise. And I wonder, friends, this morning, if Christ doesn't come to each one of us, sees us where we are, where we are. He knows what's going on in our hearts, in our lives, and he says to you, you are my beloved child. I always have time for you. Arise, arise. I love touch in the Gospel of Mark. He touches the lepers. He puts his hands on the eyes of the blind. Last week, the woman reached to touch the hem of his garment. He takes the children into his arms, and here he takes the little girl's hand and lifts her up. And this same Jesus comes to you and to me this day, and he knows whatever is going on in our lives. And I believe the more time we spend with him, the more we allow our him to take our hand and to lift us up, the more those dots and the more those stars will fall aside and we'll learn to trust in Christ alone. I don't mean to suggest that healing comes easy or overnight. It can be a long, hard journey. Eli said to the little women, you will understand, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come and see me. And let me remind you how much I care. And that's why we come to this table. To be reminded that the Christ comes to us in our brokenness and makes us whole. As a response to the word, let us sing One Bread, One Body. It's number 620 in the hymn. So 
before he said his final farewells before the cross, how Jesus was gathered with his disciples and how he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. How he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. And we remember how after the supper he took the cup and he again gave thanks, and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. 
Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world. The body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with you and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through him, with him, in him, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite those of you who wish to uh, uh, undo your communion elements. And those of you at home, we would invite you to do them the same. I invite you to take the bread and remember uh, Jesus' words. This is my body broken for you. And to drink the cup. This is the cup the new covenant. This is my blood shed for you. Hear the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let there be peace on earth. Let's see. upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go now in peace.
want to thank you for spending this time of worship with us today. And we pray as you go from this place that you will hear Christ saying to you, Arise, be whole, be healed. That you will feel the presence and the power of the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit, lifting you up and giving you courage and strength for each new day. We also pray as you go from this place that you will be generous. Generous with yourself, generous with your neighbor as Christ defines neighbor and generous with your church. For those of you who would like to support the ministries here in Willow, that address is P.O. Box 182, Willow, Alaska 99688. And now go forth into this week and know that you don't journey alone. Go forth knowing that the risen Christ wants to lift you up, to raise you up, and to make you whole. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God.